Hey guys, Al Bigley here again with another interesting tidbit from Comic Book Past. This time we're going to talk about exactly when Marvel Comics overtook DC Comics in sales. So as most fans know, DC Comics really hit it big in 1938 with the publication of Superman. Even though they've been publishing comics a few years before, lots of funny animal comics and newspaper reprints, Superman and his popularity really heralded the arrival of the superhero in comic books. So much so that in most people's minds, those two are synonymous with each other. DC would of course continue publishing Superman and other big stars like Batman, Wonder Woman, the Justice Society of America. For many years, even though after World War II, the popularity of superheroes began to diminish just a bit. DC kept publishing their big three, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman, but also filling up their lines with comic books about romance, war, western, funny animals, popular comedians of the day. And for three decades, they were unchallenged. DC thought of themselves as the Cadillac of the industry. Nothing could possibly topple their reign as top publishers of superhero fare. Sure, they had some competition with Atlas and Timely Comics, who would change their name to Marvel in the early 60s. And in the early 60s, that same company was really publishing a lot of Twilight Zone, twist ending type stories, stories about giant monsters. But the writer of a lot of these tales was starting to get bored, and his name was Stan Lee. Stan Lee's boss at Marvel, Martin Goodman, came to him one day and said, you know what, DC is having some popularity with their superheroes again. They're getting some good sales results reviving their old 40s characters, like The Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman. Maybe it's time for Marvel slash Timely to give superheroes another try. Well, a somewhat bored Stan Lee said, let's do superheroes again, but let's write them the way I've always wanted to write them. Let's give them personal problems and give them reasons for being superheroes and putting on ridiculous costumes and things like that. I'm sure Stan thought, this will never fly, but I'll at least get this out of my system. And I can team up with the artists I've already been using on the giant monster books, Tales to Astonish, Strange Tales, stuff like that. Well, you know the rest. Next thing you know, we've got the Fantastic Four, the Incredible Hulk, the Amazing Spider-Man, the Avengers, the X-Men, on and on. A funny thing happened though, around that time, right before publishing the now familiar Marvel material, Marvel kind of lost its distributor. Martin Goodman actually tried to establish his own distributorship and that failed for a number of reasons we won't get into. He was now forced to use DC Comics, his competitor. He was forced to use their distribution system. DC thinking, what can you do to harm us? We're DC Comics. We're handling your titles. It would be like Goliath saying to David, here, have these pebbles. What can you do to me? DC also said, you know what? We'll handle your books, but you're limited to just six. Six a month. Of course, Stan Lee and Martin Goodman at Marvel found a way around that. First of all, they published a lot of books like the newly revised Tales of Suspense and Tales to Astonish as half books one monthly comic that contained two characters. So in a way, that kind of filled in for having four characters and four monthly books. And you know the rest. David started overtaking Goliath. Stan Lee's innovative writing, his teaming up with his co-creators like Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby, it was an impossible to resist combination. Readers had never seen anything like these superheroes, had never seen anything like this product. They clamored for more and more. The brass at DC Comics didn't know what hit them. They saw DC as crude and rough and quick and edgy and full of energy, like, like the early days of rock and roll. And at that time, the new sound coming from England, especially the Beatles, and how that compared to what passed for pop music of the time, Paul Anka, Pat Boone, those kind of more safe bits of pop music. Also, Marvel was gaining attention with its new attitude towards superhero comics with older readers. It became hip to be a college reader of these books. 
Characters like the Hulk and Submariner and Spider-Man were seen as anti-heroes. Spider-Man seen as the new Holden Caulfield of the superhero set. Sales grew and grew. Media coverage grew and grew. Finally, in 1968, Marvel picked up a new distributor, and there were no more limits on how many books they could publish. They gave Iron Man and Captain America their own books from those earlier split books. Same with Hulk and Submariner. Books like S.H.I.E.L.D. were giving their own monthly title. Doctor Strange. And not all of this was a success, but it did grow Marvel, grew their presence on newsstands and comic book racks all across the nation. But DC, with their powerhouse figures like Superman and Batman, still topped them in sales. So what happened to finally put Marvel ahead of DC sales-wise? It was actually in 1972. Both companies agreed to a sales hike. In 1969, they had gone up to a staggering 15 cents over the previous 12 cents per copy of their comics. And both companies, Marvel and DC, decided to do a sales hike up to a staggering 25 cents each in 1972, but with added pages. So they felt like fans would see these bigger books, see the bigger price, but know, hey, I'm getting much more for my 25 cents. That was all fine and dandy, but Marvel, Martin Goodman, only did that for one month, not telling DC Comics. The next month they went back to their standard size, changed the price to 20 cents, which suddenly looked like a bargain over last month's 25 cents. Sure, it was a smaller package, but to young people, where that kind of money did mean a lot, trying to stretch your allowance to buy all these comic books, that was seen as a price drop. Yes, that was seen as a price drop, although Marvel had just raised their prices five cents more than the standard comics they were publishing two months prior. Another thing that affects all this? Sure, DC Comics went to a bigger comic book size, offering those extra pages for 25 cents, but they managed that by stuffing the rear of the comic with reprints. Again, the first half would be what you'd get every month anyway, the standard comic story, but the last half would be a reprint, and DC decided to reprint lots of 40s stories. I was just getting into comics then as a new reader, and I didn't care about these 40s stories, unless it was Batman. Young people didn't want to pick up the regular issue of Superman, get the original new story first, the brand new story first, and in the back read these what seem like ancient stories of obscure characters like the Sandman and the Newsboy Legion. Again, this helped Marvel seem even more hip, even more new. Sure, they were the younger company. And DC was stuck for several months publishing in this new size, at the higher price with the older reprints. So on the stands, again, DC seemed more expensive than Marvel, even with the bigger comic book package. But Marvel seemed like the real price winner at five cents less, even though they were the smaller comic coming out at the 20 page size every month. But that's not the end of the story either. Because of the higher price, Martin Goodman could offer wholesalers and retailers more of a price break, meaning they were more apt to handle and display Marvel Comics over any competitor, and that includes DC Comics. So yes, DC now had a bigger package, so to speak, but they cost five cents more and seemed so old and dated with all those Golden Age reprints in the back. Combine that with Marvel's retailer and wholesaler incentives, and Marvel Comics was now the number one comic book publisher in the world, breaking DC Comics 35 year reign as the king of comic book publishers. DC later cut back to the standard size package for their comics, roughly 20 pages of art, and they went to 20 cents too, like Marvel, but the damage had already been done. It was too late. Also in later years, and again, this is where I came in as a reader, all through the 70s, every 15 months, 18 months, you'd get a five cent price hike. I started buying these when they were 20 cents, soon 25 cents, soon 30, 35 cents. Marvel won out another way all through the rest of the decade by waiting four to six months to raise their prices after DC went to the higher price. Marvel's covers then would herald still 25 cents and later still 35 cents. Sometimes they held the line like that for six months, like I said. And believe me, as a young comic buyer back then, that helped bring me over to Marvel. I quit DC Comics around 1978, age 13. Loved Batman, but you just couldn't beat Marvel. 
So that was the moment Marvel overtook DC Comics in sales, 1972. Both companies agreed to a 10 cent price hike, but added more pages. Marvel went back to their standard size comics, started charging 20 cents. DC was stuck at that larger size and larger price point. And to young fans, there was no comparison. No choice at all. So I hope you enjoyed this look into one of comics mysteries of the past. If you have any questions, please let me know. Give me a, uh, a note down in the uh, comment section. Give me a like, subscribe, and let me know what you'd like me to cover in future episodes. This is a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it. And take care, and I'll see you next time.